lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Andy, thank you. All right, to kick things off, uh, thank you all for coming. We have a number of uh, recognitions to uh, start today's agenda. And first up, uh, I'd like to recognize Andy Koch for building and flying a replica of Gustav Whitehead's, Whitehead's airplane. Um, and if I might read a proclamation uh, on behalf of the town. Uh, whereas, in recognition of the recent 112th anniversary of Gustav Whitehead's 1901 historic first flight in Fairfield and Bridgeport. The town of Fairfield is proud to honor Andy Koch, who built a replica of Whitehead's airplane number 21 in 1985. And whereas Mr. Koch, a longtime Fairfield resident and a former Roger Ludlow High School science teacher, uh, I happen to be going to Ludlow at the time he was there, so I can vouch for Andy's uh, <laughs> tenure. Um, who now teaches at Platt Tech High School, and whereas, after attending a lecture about Gustav Whitehead at the Fairfield History Museum in the late 1970s and teaching a YMCA hang gliding course at Sturgis Park, Mr. Koch was inspired to build and fly a Whitehead replica, and whereas Mr. Koch flew his replica at Bridgeport Airport on December 29, 1986, flying it for 330 feet at a, a height of five to six feet above the ground, and whereas Mr. Koch took the replica to an Experimental Aircraft Association fly-in in 1987, over one million people saw the plane over a one-week period. Visitors from Luderhausen? Luderhausen. Yes, what Mr. Koch said. He's still teaching me today. Uh, Germany saw the plane and asked Mr. Koch to take it to Germany, which built its own replica. And whereas Mr. Koch appeared in a variety of TV shows such as 60 Minutes and CBS News and has displayed his replica at a variety of venues, including the Fairfield History Museum, Fairfield's Earth Day, Barnum Festival, and most recently the Discovery Museum this past Saturday uh, at a ceremony honoring Whitehead's first flight. Now therefore, I, Michael C. Tetro, first elected to the town of Fairfield, do hereby proclaim August 21st, 2013 as Andy Koch Day in the town of Fairfield. Mr. Koch, congratulations. <laughs> Can you come on up? Help me present the proclamation, Mr. Koch. Sure. Whitehead flew in 1901 right here in Fairfield, and that's amazing. Fairfield should be like Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. So we're hoping that things are going to get better for Whitehead. There is always an argument. It's hard to change people's ideas. I was brought up thinking that Whitehead, that uh, excuse me, the Wright brothers flew first. But after I built the plane and flew it, I was pretty convinced that Whitehead could easily have flown just like. Uh, just like I did. So uh, again, I hope you will follow the story about Gustav Whitehead. I hope you'll look in your attics and <coughs> cellars and try to find pictures of Whitehead in flight. We still could use some more support for Gustav Whitehead. So again, just thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I also want to recognize that from the Discovery Museum, uh, we have Mr. Dimitri Radopoulos. Vice President, Lisa Richards, Marketing Manager, and Katie Reed, Senior Associate of Special Projects and Foundation Relations. The Discovery Museum has an ongoing Whitehead 
uh, exhibit uh, and have been <coughs> crucial in terms of publicizing Mr. Whitehead's achievements and getting a record of history corrected. So thank you and, and the Discovery Museum for all your efforts on, on, your, on this part. All right, next up we have some additional recognition. Uh, recognition for the Fairfield Little High School Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America chapter winning gold slash silver medal award for National uh, FCCLA Conference, or at the National FCCL Conference. Is there somebody who can um, address us and, and give us a little more background on what your award achieved? Sure. Right. <clears throat> and excuse me, your name is? Emily. Emily, you would come to the podium. And just give us a brief introduction. We have uh, proclamations from the town for each of the young ladies as part of this. I think this is a very significant program, very significant award. It was the first I'd heard of it, and, and I think the first we as a board had heard of it, so we wanted to give you proper recognition today and give you a chance to tell us, but also the town, a little bit about the award. Uh, you're obviously setting a great leadership example for the youth in, in our community, and, and we'd like to properly recognize that. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for having us. FCCLA is uh, one of the best leadership experiences and one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life of joining. Um, it's the only family and like, consumer sciences oriented um, leadership program for high school students available. And these awards uh, were given based on a competing with a community service project at a after having qualified at a state level receiving gold, which qualified us to move on to the national level to further present our community service projects to the national level, so. Wow, congratulations, congratulations. Uh, I'm gonna read one proclamation. I have a proclamation for each of the young women. Uh, Emily Devine, Jenny Moran, Phoebe Ertel, Meredith Brown, and Melanie Jennings, and each one of these uh, recognizes today as your special day in Fairfield, so stay up late tonight. Um, uh, the town of Fairfield congratulates Fairfield Little High School student uh, Emily Devine, and I'm going to uh, use your name throughout, but the, there's a, the proclamation has your individual names on that as we go through. For winning the gold award at the Family, Career, and Community Leaders Day, uh, of Amer Leaders of America National Leadership Conference in Nashville, Tennessee uh, in July and at the State Leadership Conference in April. And whereas Emily is a member of uh, Fairfield Little High School's FCCLA chapter and is an FCCLA state officer, which state position? Um, currently the Vice President membership. Congratulations. And whereas Emily won the gold award for her stars, uh, which stands for Student Taking Action with Recognition Project, which was Healthy Eating is Elementary. And whereas the theme of this year's national conference was Discover Your Voice, over 7,000 delegates from 50 states, including Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, attended the conference. And whereas FCCLA is a dynamic and effective national student organization that helps young men and women become leaders and address important personal, family, work, and societal issues throughout through family and consumer sciences education. The organization founded in 1945 has involved more than 10 million youth and whereas FCCLA's programs are run by its members, it is the only national in-school organization with family as its central focus. FCCLA's involvement helps members become strong leaders in their communities and careers and families. Uh, there are a couple of this. Wow, well, we've got, uh, there are a couple of different things. So I'm going to, uh, with your permission, uh, read just the excerpts that, that might be a little different for each student, just so they each get their recognition here. Um, Ladies, if you would come up and surround the podium. Let's see, next up is Jenny Moran. Jenny? Okay. Thank you for coming today. 
Uh, Jenny is a member of, of Roger Little High, or Fairfield Little High School's FCCLA chapter and won the gold award for her STAR uh, project, uh, Healthy Eating is Elementary. Uh, the theme of this year's conference was Discover Your Voice, over 7,000 delegates from 50 states. And whereas FCLA is a dynamic and effective national student organization that helps young men and women become leaders, address important personal, family, work, and societal issues through the family and consumer sciences education. Um, right. It is also your special day today, Jen. Thank you. And Phoebe? Hi. Hi, Phoebe. Uh, let's see. Phoebe is a member of F uh, Fairfield Little High School's FCCLA chapter and won the Gold Star Award for, for her uh, STAR project, uh, Healthy Eating is Elementary. Uh, the theme of this year's national conference was Discover Your Voice with over 7,000 delegates from 50 states. Uh, FCLA CLA is a dynamic and effective national student organization that helps young men and women become leaders and address important personal, family, work, and societal issues through family and consumer sciences education. And congratulations on your day. You. Next up is Meredith. Thank you for coming. Uh, Meredith is a member of, of Ludlow's FCCLA chapter and is an FCCLA state officer. Meredith, which office? Um, Co-Vice President of Membership. Very good, very good. Um, Meredith won a silver award for her STAR project, Cozy Kids 3. Is that like a sequel? Was there Cozy Kids 1 and 2? <laughs> <laughs> very good. Third year we've done it. Oh, excellent. Uh, the theme of this year's national conference was Discover Your Voice, over 7,000 delegates from 50 states, including Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands attended the conference. The rest is the same on that. Uh, and Melanie Jennings. Hi. Hi. Thank you for coming. Uh, Melanie is a member of Ludlow's FCCLA chapter. She won the Silver Award for her STAR project, which is also Cozy Kids 3. Now, did you guys team together on that? Yes. And you other guys team together on the, the first one? All right. Uh, the theme of this year's conference was Discover Your Voice. Over 7,000 delegates from 50 states, including Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, attended. And the balance of the proclamation is the same. Melanie, enjoy your day. All right. Thank you, so, We've got these for each of you. Come on up. Let's see. Melanie? Mary? Thank you. Phoebe? Thank you. And Jenny? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if we can all fit in. Uh, we can try. Let's get out. I'm tall. I don't know. You don't have to do that. I should probably be looking at you. We're doing this all for Mr. Brophy's benefit. So that he's up. getting to know the cultures of every other state even though we're part of one country um, from California to Arkansas to Montana we all had different high schools and high school experiences and how FCCLA affected us so it was really interesting getting to know different people there were so many people there you just there was just a different viewpoint from everyone it was really interesting great would anyone else like to say a word say something <laughs> please um, Do you realize you're in front of 35 million people across the country? <laughs> hi, Mom. <laughs> I'll get in trouble with my dad for not saying hi. <laughs> um, it was, once again, like, going off from what Meredith said, it was interesting to meet the kids from the other states. A lot of them 
sadly weren't really sure where Connecticut was or what it was. <laughs> so it was cool to talk about how we live versus them. We did get a little political with them, I can say, about how they um, live versus our lives. And it was, it was just such an honor to be down there. And I didn't like, when we first got the gold award at the state level, I didn't think we'd actually end up going through. And it took a, it took a push with the town and stuff and our advisor, but it benefited really, really nicely in the end. Congra again, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> my colleagues, would you guys care to add a few words? Go ahead. I'd love to. I, I just want to thank each of you young women for your leadership. And I think the thing that's really interesting about this program is that it's family-based. And one thing that every human being on the planet has in common is we all are part of a family. And our lives are, in many ways, based in family. When we have careers and hobbies and all school, um, it's all part of that and in different ways. So I think it's really neat that you have an opportunity to look at that in terms of how it impacts in the greater world. So thank you for your leadership. And I'd like, I'd like to thank you as well and also congratulate you on both your awards and your representation of Fairfield across the country. You've made us all very proud. And um, like my fellow selectmen have mentioned, the emphasis on family is very important. And thank you very much for um, putting your focus on those matters for other children and younger people to learn from and to um, serve as role models for them. So thank you. I'll just echo my colleague's remarks in saying thank you for your leadership and on behalf of the town, thank you for setting such a great example for all of our youth. All right. And again, stay up late. Enjoy your day. <laughs> <laughs>
By the way, I'd be curious to hear the follow-ups on that, just as an aside. On the next page, um, within item number 15, striking the complete sentence, the selectmen thank Ms. Mr. Paulus and replace with the selectmen thanked Ms. Paulus for her work and noted the grant is about how to meet the needs of young people and prevent risky behavior. And the following paragraph strike the empire, entire paragraph that begins Selectman McCarthy V. He asked about non gathered programming and replace with Selectman McCarthy V. He asked Ms. Paulus to consider outreach to teens who do not attend programs in order to assess their needs as well. She suggested the use of social media as a potential tool. On the following page, under item number 16. Um, Alyssa Israel, her comments after the colon would be replaced with this document, research and collaboration, would put the town in a better, better position to receive grant funding from private sources and the state and federal government. Um, under item number 17, and this was Fair TV. Sorry, I wasn't noting which was which. Um, under Selectman Kylie's comments, strike the language asked about the process in place to assure independent over oversight and replace with Selectman Kylie asked how programming decisions would be made during the interim period. Mr. Canelli's reply, and I would add this sentence at the end the current committee will abide by the proposed ordinance language. And I believe that's it. Do we have a motion to accept these? We did. And second it? Yes. All right. Any further discussion? Are we ready to vote? Yes. All in favor? All right. Aye. Those opposed? One abstention. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, to consider and act upon the minutes of regular meeting July 2nd, 2013. May I have a motion to accept? So moved. A second. Second. All right. Uh, any further discussion? Ready to vote? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Next up, uh, to consider act upon the meetings of the special meeting of July 30th. 30th. May I have a motion to accept? So moved. A second. Second. Uh, any further discussion? All right. Are we ready to vote? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mr. Kelly? May I go back to June 5th? and move to accept the minutes as amended. Uh, right? Yes, thank you, you're right. We, we voted to, the um, right, okay. Yeah, I'll second that. Sorry, you did ask, okay. and we, we had a motion for the main, but Most, not the amended. We, we, we voted on a motion to accept the amendments, and I was just moving the minutes as amended. Yeah, right? what, what, since the, these are the minutes as distributed, it's simple. Go ahead and do that. Yes, sure. let's do that. Let's do that. Okay. Um, so that's uh, to reconsider. Motion to reconsider. No, I was just I was just voting to accept them as amended because we amended them and voted on the amendments. Do we need to vote on them as amended or not? The original motion was to accept the minutes as presented. Oh, it was. Yes. Then, if, then we don't need to do that. Okay. All right. Because okay. the okay. amendments okay. are included in the minutes as distributed. By voting on this, if okay. you're comfortable with that. Okay. If not, we can vote on no, to No, that explains it. That's Is fine. That okay? Yes. That's fine. Yep. Got it. Normally, we don't have the amendments already included in type format in the minutes. In the, right. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and just to check, Jen, my, my stating the motion that was originally for those minutes is correct. Yes. Okay. We're good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're off that. We're on to appointments. Um, I have a motion to accept uh, an appointment to the Golf Commission. Mr. Philip Collin, unaffiliated from 111 Arbor Terrace for a term of 49-414. He is replacing Tammy K. Peterson, who resigned. And I believe Mr. Collin is here. Second. All right. Uh, I believe Mr. Collin and some special guests are here. Yes. Uh, do we have any questions for Mr. Collin? No, I just wanted to, you know, 
thank you for volunteering to serve on this commission, and we appreciate your um, your volunteerism. We look forward to working with you. Thanks for the appointment. Yes, I concur with selecting Kylie, and also think that your background will give you a unique perspective, and I think will be welcome on the commission. So thank you very much for your willingness to serve, yeah. and to your family as well. Yeah. <laughs> Along those lines, Mr. Conniff, if you could come up to the podium, please. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's good that's good I wouldn't let you go out unsupervised either the um, again I, I want to concur with my comments I want to thank you for stepping up I think this is um, you are what we would call new blood in, in terms of uh, I think this is one of the first experience you've had in volunteering for the town in a capacity yes. like this I want to thank you for for taking the risk uh, and helping our community out uh, and also want to give you the opportunity to introduce your special guest to the rest of town. This is my, my family, my wife, Samantha, who I have to thank for bringing this position to my attention. So um, thank you and, and thank you, honey. And this is our daughter, Alexandra, six and a half, and Cameron, four and a half. Right. Uh, Alex right. started, uh, she'll be starting first grade this year at Mill Hill, and Cameron Thanks is still in, in uh, Trinity Nursery School. Wow. Alex, what's your handicap? <laughs> Ask him what his. <laughs> He's the golfer. What do you, what do you like right. to do best on the golf course? What, what's your favorite shot? Um, par three. <laughs> do you know the par the three? Par three. Par three. <laughs> he, he likes the sand <laughs> shots. <laughs> uh, let's see. Any comments from the public? All right, back to the board. Are we ready to vote? We are. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank again. you. Thank Congratulations. You. Nice to see you, Michael. Our next appointment uh, to be considered, uh, may I have a motion to accept for the Town Facilities Commission. Uh, Kimberly Marshall, Democrat, 180 Brook Bend Road for a term of 713 to 716, and this is to replace Edwin Hill, whose term expired. So moved. A second? Second. Um, any discussion? Uh, Ms. Marshall is, is here. Yeah, if we uh, have any questions, any comments from the yeah. board? Thank you. I appreciate the Cam, if you could come up to the podium okay. just for a moment. If nothing else, so the folks at home get to see you. The TFC Commission um, meetings are not always as uh, widely publicized throughout town. And again, I want to thank you. The Town Facilities Commission um, serves a wide range of needs for our town and provides some excellent advice, uh, both as we go through the budget process on certain projects but also in helping manage some of our special projects and other needs throughout the town. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a group of, of volunteers that provide exceptional technical background uh, to help the rest of us out who perhaps don't have as much technical background. So I, I think that role in the town process is extremely important. So thank you for stepping up and helping us out. You're welcome. Right. Did you so have any know. thoughts that you'd care to share? Um, actually, I did not know that uh, Fairville had so many uh, town-owned buildings besides the schools. I think it's something like 50. So I think I could probably find most of them around town, but uh, I guess I have a lot to learn as far as, you know, what, what the town owns and the condition things are in, and the whole process is something I'm very comfortable with. Okay. Well, thank you. Any comments from the public? Uh, back to the board. I just wanted to come and thank you because I know you've served in multiple roles and in terms of Woods and Osborne Hill and I want to thank you for being willing to do that. We're fortunate to have your experience as well as your expertise. So well, thank, thank you. you. We have a great town. We have great buildings mm -hmm. uh, and I'm happy to contribute any way I can. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. All right, next up, item number seven, the Greater Bridgeport Region. Oh, did we vote? I'm sorry. All in favor of that? Aye. 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 My apologies. Uh, Greater Bridge. Next up, item number seven, the Greater Bridgeport Regional Council. Uh, this is a little bit different than typically items that come before us. This is not something that technically we need to uh, approve. It could go straight to the RTM. Uh, it was my thought that it should come before this board so our board was aware of it uh, that we had a chance to uh, 
uh, hear the presentation. So that's why you'll notice that it says resolution recommended to the RTM. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so may I have a motion to uh, accept? So moved. Second. Uh, second. All right. And just to be clear, this is to hear, consider, and act upon the following resolution. Resolve the Board of Selectmen recommends that the representative town meeting adopt the attached resolution regarding Greater Bridgeport Regional Council. Mr. Bedoli is here from the uh, GBRC. And Brian, could you give us a bit of background on this? Good afternoon. Thank you for having me again. I'm here uh, to seek your support of a resolution that's been going around to our member towns. It's essentially an administrative item uh, with regards to our filing with the state of Connecticut. Uh, the state of Connecticut recently passed legislation requiring that all regional planning organizations be restructured as councils of government. Um, previously, there was three types of regional planning organizations. There was the regional planning agency, the council of elected official, and the council of governments in an effort to standardize, make it a lot more common in terms of how they de we deal with the state and our organizational structure. They want one type across the state. Um, we're in a unique position where our council of elected officials, which was provided flexibility, actually operates exactly as a council of governments today. So when we came to you about three years ago to have that conversion from the regional planning agency to the council of elected officials, that in effect made us a council of government, but our filing with the state of Connecticut was technically a council of elected officials. This would clean that up to make us in compliance with the new state legislation. So nothing changes, not this, none of the services that we provide the town, no costs or additional being incurred. All right. And simply, just to provide some background, um, I get together with other first select and other mayors from the region. Uh, we consider uh, different programs and regional events. Uh, we keep each other up to date as to, to what's going on from that standpoint. The GBRC works with us uh, to coordinate state grants and importantly federal grants uh, to make sure that when it crosses town boundaries or can be best uh, approved and managed by them to get individual town uh, benefit from that so it's, it's something that we have on an ongoing basis mm -hmm. so it's literally uh, changing the label on the group as opposed to changing the process in terms of what takes place so any uh, questions no I having served on the RTM at the time the first transition was made that was a big question people wanted to know um, how many other groups had already signed on and, and where that was in the process, which I don't I anticipate you'll have the same types of questions um, with that going forward. Um, but what happens if we don't adopt this resolution? Um, well, essentially the state, there isn't anything really punitive at this point. Um, they're recommending that we all adopt it by January 1st, 2015 with you know, subsequent legislation. Effectively, what they're saying is that regional planning organizations of our type will not exist anymore. What that means in terms of our you know, overall structure, given the fact that we're funded by a variety of sources that are outside of the state requirements, um, we still would maintain the same board, just probably lose maybe some state funding as a result. So, so assuming that they would pass the legislation, that's not hard and fast yet. It's kind of vague. So. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Any comments from the public? Uh, back to the board. Are we ready to vote on our recommendation? Yes. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Brian, thank you. Thank you very Thanks much. Brian. Thank you. Next up, item number eight um, from the Director of Public Works, which would require Board of Finance and RTM approval to hear, consider, and act upon the following resolution as recommended by the Director of Public Works. Resolved that the Town of Fairfield appropriate $1.3 million towards the cost of creating a microgrid to serve fire headquarters, police headquarters, the cell tower at 100 Reef Road, uh, ECC or Emergency Communication Center, and Operation Hope. And further resolved that the first selectman is authorized to accept and expend a grant from the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection in the amount of 1.167, uh, 1.1, $1,167,659 to pay a portion of the cost of such appropriation. Further resolved that the first selectman is authorized to execute on behalf of the town of Fairfield any and all necessary documentation 
to secure such a grant. I have a motion to accept. So moved. A second. second. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And just to be clear on the math, that's going to leave about a uh, 133k. It's about a 90% reimbursable grant. Yeah. So the yeah. town is is putting in approximately $130,000 if this is approved by all the boards. Uh, Mr. Bowman, would you care to take us through this, please? Sure. And the concept here is to provide secure uh, power to critical facilities in the town during times of either storm or in times any other time when power is interrupted for any reason whatsoever. And you do by doing that through what's called a microgrid. It involves a lot of electronic and communications data through very sophisticated computers. And what it would do is, and right now, if power goes out, even the, the existing generator we have at the uh, police station would shut down. It's called running in parallel. When you have on-site generation, when power lines go out, they shut down and emergency generators kick in. The reason they shut down is they're afraid of a surge of power when power lines come back and an alignment or someone could get killed or it could blow down. Uh, you know, people think lines aren't charged. All of a sudden, the generator power goes on that line back, flows across the lines. So what, what this program does is allow it to run in island mode, they call it. So all our generation, the photovoltaic, the your existing generator, the emergency generator, would all run you know, when power lines are down. So the 100 percent of the power needs would be met at all times. Uh, the emergency generator we have there would be converted to natural gas because the requirement of the grant is you have a 30-day supply of fuel for the emergency generator. And there's no way we could have a 30-day tank of the diesel fuel for that generator. By just replacing that with an emergency generator that runs on natural gas, just runs off the line in the ground. And then we can use that emergency generator in another building somewhere. Uh, so the grant does provide for all the only thing the town the grant doesn't provide for is capital so the grant provides for all the computerized equipment it provides for all the lines in the street the interconnect agreement with the united illuminating a whole bunch of other technical stuff but it will not buy the emergency generator so therefore we've budgeted one hundred fifteen thousand dollars with uh, a few thousand dollars over to buy and install an emergency generator at the police station we do have a price from yankee electric for that generator but just in case there's a little overrun somewhere we have an extra what is it, $17,000 available for any kind of overrun. The price from Schneider Electric, who is our contractor there, is a fixed price, fixed price contract. It's a design build. Uh, no matter what, it, he gets paid that amount of money, and he gets paid that amount of money by the state government. However, it's a reimbursable grant, therefore we have to appropriate the money, expend it, and they get reimbursed by the state. Uh, the amount of time we're doing this work is only like three or four months. So it'll be done and completed by January or February, and the reimbursement will be made before the end of the fiscal year. So I think that sums it up. Uh, just a couple questions, if I might, just to clarify a few things. Mm -hmm. uh, one, you, you answered the timing. Thank yes. you very much on that. Uh, in terms of the town contribution, could you clarify where that would come from? Uh, that would come from uh, an appropriation from uh, surplus. Uh, and then, because we uh, actually technically, I think we uh, you mentioned contingency. Yeah, current contingency, year contingency right. fund when we talk contingency, about that. Contingency, right? Sorry. So that's why, just to clarify to the, the board, that's why there's no bond resolution before us. So the idea is that we would be um, expending this money, getting reimbursed, and using the um, current year contingency fund to fund the 130, approximately 130 thousand dollar contribution from the town on this. One thing I did forget to mention, it, it's a very important part of this grant, is the cell tower. Uh, it found during uh, the last few storms in a number of places, the cell tower communications were down as well as the phone lines. People who had fire, police, or ambulance emergencies had no way to get in touch with the emergency communication center in some towns. They couldn't use the landlines, they couldn't use cell phone lines. So that, for that reason, we, wanted, we made sure that all these cell phone lines would also be part of the system. It's no good to have an emergency communication center if you can't get you know, through it to them. So. Yeah, and just to clarify, in Fairfield, we did not have that problem with our cell tower. Right. Right. However, Mr. Bowman's correct. As we sat in on the uh, statewide conference calls, there were a number of smaller municipalities across the state mm -hmm. uh, where cell towers went down, and that um, hurt communication in a wide variety of areas, including emergency communication. So let's ensure that it never happens. And Mr. Bowman, um, 
any data on payback for this expenditure based on? Not really. I mean, we're talking about an emergency power. It would be, it would depend on the amount of time power is out, you know, from a storm or event. So, $115,000 is not really a payback item. It's really just having that power needed when necessary. Okay. So this is for, in essence, security of our communication system. That's correct. So that it's continuously up and running. That's correct. Regardless of power availability. It's not just a move for more efficient or cheaper. Right, it's not a move at all. It's more for reliability. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the board, Kristen? A few. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. As I said to you the other day, I think today is the Ed Bowman Show at the Board <laughs> of Selectmen. It's amazing the work that you are doing. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about the math and make sure that I'm understanding uh, the resolution. The grant amount from DEEP is $1,167,659. Um, the appropriation is $1.3 million, and the difference is the 132, which is to pay for that natural gas right. generator. 115, or 111000 I guess, is for that, and the 17000 is a contingency mm -hmm. in case we need it for some unexpected uh, problem with the emergency generator. Okay. Okay. Great. Just wanted to, I was noticing that in the letter from the state that they had reduced the grant amount you had requested 1.2 but they reduced the amount and that cost is actually gone right it was it double was counted that's right. okay um, but also I would also point out what doesn't show here is that that company Schneider like to work with us uh, to provide uh, all these applications over the last year without getting paid they took the risk that they would get the grant and if they got the grant they did get their upfront cost reimbursed by another fifty two thousand dollars but we did not have to pay for that. They assumed that risk. If we didn't win the grant, they wouldn't have got paid at all. So I think that was very nice of you to say the least. Any further questions? Um, just, and I'm trying to find the attachment. It was attachment E, and I don't see it in the printed. I'm trying to go back on my, um, it talked about annualized costs, and I'm not, if I'm remembering correctly, had to do with the the gas. No. Yeah, uh, just while uh, Kristen's looking at that, Mr. Bowman, can you step us through any uh, what's going to happen on an annual basis for this? What are the operating costs? The only operating cost of the town would be there'd be two. One is if we use burn natural gas for emergency generator, and there may be another cost which we haven't looked at yet, but. I would like to have uh, proposed that there's an opera, a maintenance agreement for the system. Schneider elected to give us an agreement to, to make sure it's running properly. I don't think it's the kind of thing the town employees have, you know, the kind of capacity to do it. So that, that's not a known cost yet. We haven't asked them about that. But I'm sure it's like if we're talking about eight or $10,000 a year, not a, you know, a large cost. Okay. How long would it take to get that uh, maintenance agreement or kind of a... I'm sure we'd have it within a week. Mm -hmm. So may I follow up on that? That's Please. essentially my question. I, the attachment E was the annual operating budget summary um, for the microgrid and the costs broken out were for fuel but also purchased utility power, which was the largest um, amount of that. But we do that anyway. I, yeah. that, exactly. That's what I was about that's to say. That, that cost would be happening one way or another. So really the only difference is what you just said yes. to the first left minutes. The, the fuel and perhaps the maintenance yes. contract. Okay. Um, the only other question I had was, do all the parties involved who will be impacted physically, structurally, know that this is happening the fire department operation hope uh the police department has yep. everyone we all met together just a few weeks ago to go through all this stuff. wonderful all right thank you i don't know about the cell phone operators but they don't that's just going to attach their power there's no change there so great thank you right. mr Collins. thank you ed how are you very good yeah. a couple quick questions on the generator i just want to make sure i'm clear because in, in, in the last couple, two or three years, we've purchased a number of generators around town. This is 
this is not any of those this is specific to this program and is it duplicative to any generator we currently have yes, it is. It's so on site which we would uh, replace with the natural gas generator and take this generator use it on a different building uh, perhaps a school building I'm, I know the first select one has uh, made some inquiries of the superintendent <coughs> so if there's any school building that could use it it's it's a three or four year or five year old generator it's perfectly okay. good it's mm -hmm. just it doesn't fit the requirements of the microgrid okay good and I think you did mention that that there was a uh, a, a second generator before so thank you for that as far as the the uh, 30 day uh, fuel uh, storage requirement and you said we can't do that with diesel and that's because of physical reasons yeah physical space on that site you don't have you don't At have room. sewage treatment plant the public garage we could do it mm -hmm. not there right but a natural gas line that's underground potentially susceptible to certain types of yeah natural disasters is okay and does qualify yes. as a constant flow yeah, that's one of the things they they wanted to see actually it was yeah okay yes it could be disrupted but that's not likely that's at that site unless it was an explosion I mean, a natural disaster like down the beach would disrupt those lines but up there they it's out of the hundred year flood plan they don't believe it would uh, pose any kind of a measurable problem okay so even though that gas line is potentially disruptive yeah I asked that question at the time yeah all right and but it certainly qualifies for this yes okay and you do have a contingency so the the 115 is for the generator the 17 is for the yep. contingency and the 132 plus the 1.1167 gets you up to 1.3 exactly okay so I'm, I'm, I'm good on the math I guess my next question is for first select and tetra so <coughs> can we just quickly talk about where we're going to the 132,000 from and any details on that? Uh, just from contingency in the current year budget. From contingency in the current year budget? Correct. Okay, so I, I'm assuming there's plenty of room in there to do that? Uh, yeah, there's enough room to cover this expenditure. Correct. Okay, so um, I'm trying to go back to our Board of Finance days. When we move money from contingency, who has to act and vote on that? Is it uh, us and the Board of Finance or just the Board of Finance? Well, I, uh, the actual transfer yeah, uh, like is typically voted on by the Board of Finance at the end of the year. Uh, like coming up in next month, the Board of Finance will be voting on different transfers for accounts as, as all the accounts are balanced up and cleaned up uh, as part of the year in processing. Right. That's all right. Uh, this, the purpose of this is to make it clear that we plan on doing that so that, that all the boards, um, Board of Finance and RTM, mm -hmm. as well as our board, have basically uh, voted and approved in concept that we'll be making that transaction. Right. So when, when the Board of Finance does their annual cleanup work in September, that's, that's the work. In this case, June. it would be September of next year but yes also you're talking about looking at the september of 14 cleanup work for june 30th of 13. 14. june 30th of 14. we're already past june 30th of 13. right but when they meet in a couple weeks and do the cleanup work they're doing it for this past june yeah because this right. won't have been approved by the rtm yet right and it won't have been spent yet so it's part of the current year budget fiscal 14. it's not part of fiscal 13 which is done right so following that just for a minute just so I can understand it so the current year the 2014 contingency from your perspective is is has enough money in it to cover this particular item correct okay so thinking through that in the past when we were moving a significant amount of money from contingency what type? Of, what what action did the board of selectmen take? I just don't remember. Do we do um, we have do we have to vote on that? Because I think there there are two issues here. Traditionally, we wouldn't be voting on moving money from contingency at this point in the year. Correct. Because that it, I, because normally you're going through the operating budget, mm -hmm. and as things get plused and minus throughout there, you wait until the end, see where they came out, uh, and then make um, adjustments from that point this being an item that in essence is outside of the <coughs> operating budget mm -hmm. so the question then becomes uh, if we were funding this um, if we were taking four or five years to get this 1.3 million dollars back mm -hmm. we would probably go out with a bonding resolution right right and mm -hmm. 
and, kind of replenish yeah, and it do as what we, we normally so do. So there'd be a bonding resolution attached to this. Right, right, right. Uh, in essence, we'd be bonding the our town share in that case because mm -hmm. of what we're doing here because it's a short-term project with a very short-term payback uh, all happening within the current fiscal year. Um, we don't need a bonding resolution for that. Right. We can then, uh, and, and we're able to take the uh, town share or contribution uh, out of the current year contingency. Okay. So it's because it's in such a short term, all within the current fiscal year, we can make those transactions. Okay. That transfer uh, at the end of the year, next September, as we're cleaning up all the accounts, uh, we would then uh, either take that out of contingency or whichever other kind of account was available. Right now, the plan is to use contingency to do that. The actual accounting transaction would be approved uh, by the Board of Finance at that time. Right. And I, I get all of that. Um, I, I guess the question that's still lingering is this is a great project, so please excuse the uh, financial questions. No. By, by voting for the 1.3, we're committing to the 130, is what this Correct. vote tonight tells Correct. me. Yes. So if I'm committing to the 130, I'm just wondering if there's any legislative action that needs to take place to memorialize that 130, whether it's just us voting on a transfer from contingency or us voting on something else, just to, to validate that we are agreeing to assume that $132,000 of liability and fund it from contingency. Uh, it, am, I, am I asking it the right way? Uh, I, and I hear what you're saying, and I'm grateful for this discussion because I think in the language of the resolution, it's clear we're committing to the 1.3. We'll get back. Maybe. Most of it. Oh, yeah. right. right, right. But I actually, you know, in thinking about this more and even as listening to the conversation, the intent would be to fund it out of contingency, right? That would be the intent. Obviously, we're early in the year, and if we have some interesting events uh, weather-wise, as we did last year, there may have to be different conversations on many levels about our budget as we have had this year. So I think mm -hmm. in some respects, my comfort level would be to vote the general resolution as it is, understanding that the Board of Finance at the end of the next fiscal year, you know, certainly at that point in time, if we find we want to make a statement as to our um, preferences, but that the Board of Finance will be having mm -hmm. to make those ultimate decisions, mm -hmm. and even administratively during the year, if we find that the contingency is going to be overburdened, then this may end up having to come out a different way through management of the public works budget, for example. Not ideal, but whatever. Mm -hmm. I guess what I'm saying is I would rather vote as it is today, recognizing that our intent and our hope is that it can come out of contingency, but that we don't know what the year holds. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I, I think to um, reinforce that, I mean, at some point, uh, you know, we have an obligation with every operating budget to finish on a positive note. And that is our goal this year as well. Mm -hmm. um, Kristen, your point's well taken. And, and that to say exactly, to make a transfer out of contingency right now um, may not be needed and may not be appropriate based on how the year finishes out and where we have a plus or minus in that. But knowing that we plan to use this much of contingency, we know right. that we have less contingency available so if any uh, unusual circumstances mm -hmm. or unique events take place, we then have to manage to that unique event. We know we don't have as much fallback. If, um, you know, it's the uh, same thing as having Hurricane Irene happen early in the year, and we know we have to account for that, versus um, another storm happening in May or June, or a Nemo happening in February or March, where we know we have a lot of overtime that we hadn't planned to up to that point, but then we have to compensate for that and make that up uh, in different accounts in the budget. So that is part of the ongoing management. Um, and Kevin, as we've adjusted the Board of Finance, Kristen, as you've seen on the RTM, as we've gone back and adjusted mm -hmm. those operating accounts going through. So. Um, yeah, and, uh, and I'm not disagreeable with any of that. I'm just trying to understand it because this is a big chunk that we're committing to early in the year. So maybe what would be helpful is if 
maybe at our next meeting or even at the Board of Finance meeting and I can, you know, get my information there. If we could just get like an update on where we are with the current year contingency because I just don't, I just have to, I don't have a feel for how robust it is at the moment. Yeah, the, the, simple, the simple answer is um, we generally don't make any transfers out of contingency until the end of the year when we see how the other accounts roll up and we're balancing those out and we plus and minus everything out to see if based on all the other pluses and minuses, we need to use any of the contingency. So that would be difficult to impossible to do at this point because we haven't taken anything else out of contingency. Uh, and there haven't been any settlements that have come out of there or anything like that yet? Not this year. Not, not this year. Okay. All right, let me just yeah. put some thought behind that. I, I again, recognize Selectman Kylie's hesitation. I think my, um, the one thing I will say is that if, if possible, I would like, I would prefer from my standpoint that this, if it can in the end, come out of contingency as opposed to out of the public works budget mm -hmm. because of the constraints that they faced last year and um, I, I will just say that, but recognize okay. that, you know, the year, okay. we won't know for certain until we're farther into the year. We'll have, we'll have a better ability to, that's why I suggested that right. if we want to come back to it as we get closer to year end. And that's perfectly fine. So that would lead me to my, I think my last question on this, because um, assuming all that's correct and accurate and agreeable, does the language we have in front of us that's technically committing us to 1.3, which is 132,000 above what we know we're going to get back. Do we want to at least reflect something in here about how we, because we, we're, we're actually going to be voting on something that's committing to $133 or $133,000 worth of town funding, and we really aren't stating how we plan to fund it. Would it be, would it be, would it be appropriate to just add on to here that we expect to fund this out of contingency, just so the books balance, because we've got 1.3 going out and the difference coming, or the 1.167 coming in. I'm, I'm not sure how to word it, but my suspicion is that subsequent bodies are going to look at this in a similar fashion and, and wonder what we're committing to and how we're going to honor that commitment or from where, e even if it's contingency or in subject to change. Yeah. Well, it, it, uh, I think that was the, the reason for my questions to Mr. Bowman up front to clarify for this board exactly how that Math. transaction yeah. has taken place. Yeah. I think it, it to uh, address that and add in something that, that the difference or the town share will be funded out of the current year operating budget. Uh, let people clarify exactly what is intended uh, without being... Uh, the need to be any more specific than that, so that we have the um, flexibility to go back at the end of the year based on how it counts plus and minus out to um, fund it appropriately. But it's going to be funded out of the current year operating budget. Okay, so so you would you would propose that say further resolve, etc., that the town portion be funded from the current year operating budget than then it's specifically saying from the current year contingency account. Is that what you're Correct. proposing? Correct. Do you want to? I, I think that's agreeable language and I think it at least raises the issue to the forefront for another body to, you know, you know have a view on it. Yeah, we absolutely want to be very clear on that in terms of we're not bonding it. Yep, we're, we're not, not bonding we're it. Not we're not taking out of surplus. That's kind of not coming out of surplus. It's coming out of the current year operating budget. Somewhere from the budget. That would be agreeable language. At least we've addressed it in the in the books balance, and we can move on with the more important matter of approving a great project. <laughs> so, I move. May I? Go for it. Okay, I move to amend item eight at the end of the second paragraph to read further resolved that the town share. of this project is to be funded from the 2013-2014 town budget. Uh, town operating budget? Town operating budget, thank you. That way it puts it in there for discussion. Yep. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion on the amendment? 
Any no. amendment only? No, I think it's good. Okay. Any comments from the public? Back to the board. Are we ready to vote on the amendment? Mm -hmm. yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, the motion as amended is before us. Any further discussion on the motion? Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Yeah. Any comments <laughs> from the public? Back to the board. Are we ready to vote? Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Bowman, thank you. Um, I guess you can stay I'm there. Right? I was going to say you could leave, but. All right. <laughs> Item nine from the Director of Public Works to here consider and act upon the following resolution as recommended by the Director of Public Works. Resolved that the commercial property assessed clean energy agreement, also known as CPACE, between the Town of Fairfield and the Connecticut Clean Energy and Investment Authority is hereby approved and further resolved that the first selectman is hereby authorized to execute such agreement on behalf of the town. May I have a motion to accept? So moved. A second. Second. Uh, Mr. Bowman, can you fill us in? Yes. So in 2012, Connecticut passed legislation that provides that for owners of commercial industrial property and including multi-family multi properties of five units or more, uh, be able to borrow money at a subsidized rate to do energy uh, efficiency or energy generation improvements on their properties. Uh, Fairfield was one of the targeted communities, 15 or so targeted communities, because it has the amount of existing commercial industrial property that is 50 years old or older is significant. It may not make a similar part of our tax base that much, but it is a significant amount of property at that age. So it was a targeted town. Uh, the program is set up so that the state pre-approved a list of contractors to do the work. They pre-approved a list of uh, engineers that could uh, help people design and uh, price out the work. They then uh, the building owner then chooses the work that wants to be done and submits that to the CFU, the Connecticut Clean Energy Finance Authority, for approval. Once the application is approved and funding is installed, then the, the work begins. Now, prior, after its, uh, the work is done, a lien is placed on the property. And it's a lien that stands in front of everything. It's the only thing it's subordinated to is property taxes. It stands ahead of the mortgage on the property. So it requires the approval of any property owner with a mortgage to do this. And there hasn't been any problem with that around the state. Half the banks that have the mortgage are also loaning the money through the CPACE program, more and more. Uh, second, so that means that the loan stays with the property, not with the property owner. He sells the property, the loan stays there. Yeah, that, that's an important part of this. It's really the, to the property. The, the, town's, uh, the cost of the town is, is almost minimal. Our tax collector actually worked with the Tax Collectors Association in Connecticut and the company that does the computerized tax collection were to develop a program to make this work at almost no cost. And almost everybody's using the program now. But the amount of estimated cost for the town for a year is something like four or five hundred dollars, which the state will actually reimburse us the time involved in doing that. So it's a very smooth program running forward. And the whole intent of it is to you know to create more green power. As the United Illuminae and the other companies are required under the state law to buy 20% of their power from green sources in Connecticut over the next 22 years, some of which they could build themselves. The other way they do it is through this, uh, well, so I'm switching programs. <laughs> That's the other next one. So I'll stop right there for that. Um, any further questions from the board? Oh, oh OK, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Um, how has the reception in the community been to the program? Have you had a lot of interest from commercial yeah. developers and building owners? The economic development director has some interest from developers and a few building owners who have already called and looking for us to do the program. But the concept here is they, they feel if they get four or five buildings a year, that's a significant amount of projects per town. So it's not going to be a rush of 100 buildings. It's okay. going to be a four or five in a year's time. That's significant. Okay. And we feel they already have two who are interested. And I think the more I get interested is developers and uh, engineers go talk to them about the program. They start mm -hmm. to learn more about it. So okay. we'll see what happens. Okay. And you made you made a comment that I didn't catch all the way about the loan staying with the building, even yes. if the building is sold. Can you just explain right. that better? Again, it's a lien based on the property until right. it's until like a mortgage until it's put paid off. Right. And so the tax lawyer then collects the money, just like they do taxes and twice a year sends it to the state. Uh, if the property is sold, the new owner assumes 
that, that obligation, and the lien stays with the new owner on that property until it's paid off. Oh, so it, it doesn't get satisfied at closing? No. It stays, okay, and yeah. it, it, it moves with the property? That's correct. Okay. Thanks. Thank you again, Mr. Bowman. You, when you're talking about all the details, it just helps me to realize all the work that you've done to put into for getting this in front of us, and I'm grateful. Um, clearly, you have talked to the tax collector and the town clerk based on your comments and um, the fact that she has yeah, well, had experience. And the so. finance director. The, th the three of them really worked together. We wouldn't bring this program until the finance director signed off on it. It wouldn't cost the town any money, so it took a while, but we got it done. Gotcha. That was so. That was one of my questions. You mentioned that, if I heard correctly, the state will reimburse us for any time with billing or any of the, the administrative, administrative costs. Yeah, because there really isn't any time with billing. It's just a computer-generated bill, okay. just like a tax bill. Okay, which is great. Um, you also mentioned the other municipalities that it's been received well. How many municipalities are you aware of who are taking part so far, and how do you know There's how it's uh, working for them? Something like 14 to 16 municipalities have uh, participated. Bridgeport, Westport has. Westport is very satisfied with it. Uh, I didn't check with Bridgeport. I'm sure they're very satisfied also. But you know, Westport, very some of us is very happy with the uh, program. So, I I'm very excited about this program. I think it's a phenomenal opportunity um, for our businesses and a great way for public and private folks to partner. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was that. There's already been interest expressed. Do yep. we have any plans to get the word out further, or yeah, uh, economic any? development department is going to do that, okay. implementing it through. There are the natural ones to do it. They have the contacts and that those group of taxpayers are going to do that. Yeah. <coughs> if I might expand on that, just to uh, uh, Mark Barnhart and I have talked uh, quite a bit about this as this program has been working its way through and as we've been dotting the i's and crossing the t's before bringing it to this board. Uh, this is is really uh, uh, another program or benefit to our commercial taxpayers in town and the idea is that this is another opportunity for us to to get some payback for our taxpayers uh, in this case from the state and from their use of uh, green energy it's good for the economy it's good for the environment uh, and this will become part of uh, a communication or marketing program uh, from mr. Barnhart's office out to the, the uh, Landlords, uh, property owners, and business owners in uh, our town to take advantage of this. Great. One last question on the green energy component: the twenty percent requirement. Um, is there enough Actually, local? That, that's that's the next problem. I used, that was a summer. Oh. I mixed that up. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> there's, there's. I'm sorry. I got I, confused there for a minute. Okay. So there isn't the requirement for these no. folks to use 20% of their energy. No. That's the next one. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. The hope is that they will put forward with that again, but it's not a requirement. Got it. Thank so you. So just as another um, follow-up on I mean, all the things that are eligible, it's amazing looking at this list, the high-efficiency lighting, mm -hmm. hot water heating systems, renewable energy systems. It's really a great opportunity for people. Yeah. Absolutely. Good. Any Good. comments from the public? Seeing none, back to the board. Are we ready to vote? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mr. Bowman, thank you, and uh, I think you're up next. Yes. Uh, <laughs> item number 10 from the Director of Public Works to hear, consider, and act upon the following resolution as requested by the Director of Public Works. Resolve that the granting of an easement to ENCON for the purpose of erecting a photovoltaic electric generation system at the Fairfield train station parking lot uh, at 165 Uncle Road for sole benefit of Tomlinson Middle School. The term of the agreement being 20 years B and hereby is approved. May I have a motion to accept? So moved. A second. Second. All right. Uh, Mr. Bowman, can you step us through that? Yes. This is a, you know, a solar program where they would actually build the structure over the parking lot and provide shelter from rain, snow, and the elements. Right? Mm -hmm. It'll be built high enough so we can plow under it. It'll be protected so the pylons are going to be backed up by cars car, won't get hit by the cars. And it'll provide a, a megawatt of electricity for uh, Thomason Junior High School. Underneath the covers also, the LED lighting will be installed so there'll be light in there. And one or two electric charging stations will be added to this as part of the program. Uh, the benefit, the parking authority benefit is not they can't provide the electricity for two sources. But what they're going to do is provide them the money to pay for their electric bills as far as 
so in addition to providing the power for Thomason, they would provide cash to pay for the electric bill of the train station that the parking authority now pays. So it's a triple benefit there. You get power to one, money to another, and we also get electric charging stations for electric cars as part of this. Uh, this is not a unique project per se. They've been doing this in Long Island, Long Island Railway Station. A number of them already have this kind of project. There's a couple of upstate that have it. And it's the same as we're putting in the recreation center parking lot. So mm -hmm. this is the largest one we've attempted. One megawatt, it's a significant amount. Now the whole the the way this program works, I think you're familiar. We did the last time the LRX Zero program, so I, unless you want me to, I won't get into that again. Kristen, I if I'm correct, do, I don't know that we have printed materials, background materials. We haven't I actually. I've been waiting to get it from this contractor. Mm -hmm. I haven't got it yet. So okay. I've got some. Preliminary stuff, but not the final power purchase agreement. Mm -hmm. He keeps his computer broke down. He said, blah, blah, blah. "We're waiting." And I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Bowman had mentioned that before the meeting, and I forgot to make note of that. We don't have the backup material. Right. Is should we? Uh, is there a motion to postpone this, or are you comfortable going ahead without seeing the actual purchase power agreement? Well, Mike, I think the question would be, and actually, that's a question for all of these, and which I think I asked last time is, has the town attorney had a chance to review these documents? I'm not comfortable. No. If there's not, if there's not a timeline issue, I would prefer postponing it. There is a timeline issue. However, I think the first meeting in September, of the board of selectmen would still get this to the RTM. Yeah, that's the that's the yes, it's the second yeah. week in September, yeah. but it would still get it to the RTM because there's no requirement yeah. to go to the board of finance when there's no appropriation. Okay. So that would yeah. I agree. All the other uh, proposals we have before you, the contracts have been reviewed by the town attorney and approved by the town attorney, or changes were made to comply with uh, what he wanted and uh, economically what I wanted. But the main thing is that all of them guarantee that for 20 years we will pay less for electricity, than, or the same or less than we're paying now. And that, that's the biggest thing. Now, we, set, we have that in writing for all but this one, so I would agree with you. I think it should be postponed until we actually have it. And uh, Stan has a chance to read the agreements. Yeah, so I move that we postpone this item to our September 11th meeting. Second. Second. Okay. Um, as part of our discussion, that postponement, just to make sure that we have all the data or information available at that next meeting. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bowman, could you just confirm that this is all take this easement is all on town property? That's correct. We right, stayed so away from the state-owned property at the railroad yeah. It's all on town. Okay. It's all on town. And yeah. it's been reviewed by the parking authority? Yes, the parking authority is, is the one we brought forward from the parking authority. They were, they were very enthusiastic about this. For the next meeting, would it be possible to get a brief letter, memo, just yeah. They're going to they're they're formally act on it at their next meeting. Yeah, so uh, but they haven't got the proposal yet either. Okay. The concept has been approved by them, not the proposal. Okay. Okay. And in September, the Board of Education also acts on it because they're receiving the power right so by the time the RTM gets to it you should have approved it hopefully the parking authority and the Board of uh, Education for the parking authority if we get documentation that they approved just since it, yep. it's a key part of their and because of your affiliation with DPW I'm assuming you've discussed this with DPW yep. and for things like snow plowing yes exactly and yeah. paving also it reminds me of your suggestion we checked the fire department to make sure emergency vehicles get through there and buses in the time of when the mm -hmm. trains are done. It actually sh amounted to shifting some of the project to mm -hmm. allow for that to happen. So right, right. that was good. Okay. Thank you. Then uh, those are my questions those are my questions uh, that I just wanted to address before we vote on the postponement. Mm -hmm. Any other questions before we vote on the postponement? Um, just one and, and, and if you don't know the answer now you can bring it back later. This is a much larger structure than the one that we're putting over by the recreation yes, center. It's the same type of structure with all these other components that we talked about. So I guess my question is, in a structure this large, that's got a large, you know, platform, under heavy snow and other, other weather mm -hmm. conditions, how are structures like this holding up in other areas where they might get 24 inches of snow dead smack in the middle of it? And that's a lot of weight, and I just don't know yeah. well, it, the one how that's working out. It's three or four things. One, it isn't one structure. It's a series of structures. Okay. There would be openings between, you know, where there's lines okay. for cars, right? It becomes a series of smaller structures. Right. Okay. Secondly, they, they design it in a way so that it actually flows. It's tilted. It's not a flat surface. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the experience is that it all flows to the center and, and then down. Okay. But only occasionally they actually have to get up there and remove the snow. Okay. So it's, it's worked upstate Connecticut. It's worked. Island, so. Okay. 
Well, it's just, yeah, right, if it was flat, I don't think I'd trust that. How are you going to get up there to clean it up, which is their problem. But still, this way it gets the snow to one focal point and then down to the ground. Where it the runs off. Away, okay, thanks. I'm good. Yeah, I've, just as an aside, uh, down where the Eagles play in Philadelphia, the entire parking lot. Sorry, oh, we don't want to talk about non-giant football teams. Here. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, the Giants play. I second that. Okay. Well, the bottom line is they have an entire parking lot full, really. so it's, it's, I'm excited to talk about it, but I'm still one of those. didn't interfere with your tailgate? Uh, I'm not, I actually don't go to the Eagles games. No charcoal <laughs> fires. That's, under that's a good note. You're I was at a Phillies game, actually. That's where I saw it. Where's your gavel? The, um, <laughs> all right. Uh, any comments from the public? I don't have some fun here. Back to the board. Any further discussion? Are you no, stretching uh, your arm? Yes. Ms. Grasso? No. One comment from the public. One of the public is wondering how many parking spaces this will take up. It doesn't take up any. It won't. It won't reduce the park space at all. Oh, okay. no. Where will it be? Where will it be? Over the parking lot. Um, so it's right over the parking lot. So they're all the cars are under. Yes. Covered parking. Um, yeah. <laughs> Back to the board. Good. Uh, are we ready to vote on the postponement of this item uh, to the date certain the next board of selectmen yeah. meeting? Uh, rec next, uh, actually, it's going to be a special meeting, not a regular scheduled meeting. So the next special meeting of the board of selectmen. I think we do vote on that as our regular schedule. So it is a regular schedule. Is it a regular schedule. scheduled meeting? Yes. Oh, okay. Special. Okay. The and next regularly scheduled out. meeting. Fair enough. Uh, is there a motion to accept that postponement? We did, I think. Did we, we do did. that? Yeah, I moved and second. Okay, we so did we not. Vote. Are we ready to vote? Yes. yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. <laughs> well, let's see who's up next. <laughs> Mr. Bowman. Jay. Uh, to hear, consider, and act upon the following resolution as requested by the Director of Public Works. Resolved that granting of an easement to Green Skies for the purpose of erecting a photovoltaic electric generation system on the roof of Public Works Garage at 705 Richard White Way for the sole benefit of Public Works Garage. The term of this agreement is being <coughs> 20 years. B and hereby is approved. May I have a motion to accept? So moved. A second. Second. Uh, items now before us, Mr. Bowman. This one's easier. Again, it's just a rooftop. Uh, they don't even need to require a lease. They're just looking for a right-of-way agreement. The lease comes about from their financing companies. They would, the town doesn't require it, but some of the finance companies require a lease. They just have an, uh, a right-of-way, the right of access to the roof for 20 years. That's all they require. So it's just a power purchase agreement with a right of access, so there's no lease required on this one. And again, uh, it's the same thing. It's guaranteed for 20 years. They would pay uh, the same or less for electricity. Uh, it's designed, built, owned, and operated and financed by the private company. And the, our only involvement in it is buying electricity at a cheaper price. There's absolutely no other obligation in the town. After 20 years, we can either have a right to either renew the contract, buy it from them at an agreed upon price, which is in the agreement, year by year, if it terminated, what it would cost us to buy it, or we can tell them to take their property and leave. But that's simple as that. So it covers the contingencies after 20 years as well as what happens in the first. 20 years. Any questions from the board? Kristen. Just confirming um, the price of electricity is the same price as today or less than today or no less than whatever we were paying that's, on. That's that's what I'm But we did I I the most conservative. I I made them price it for twenty years as if our price today would never increase. So we're paying an average of fifteen and a half percent cents a kilowatt hour today. So which they're measuring against that price for 20 years. So if they couldn't charge us more than that over the next 20 years. So it's measured against today's price. If the price goes up over 20 years, we're going to save more money. Uh, all these projects put That's together. It. That was my question. Okay. Yeah. They try using the most conservative, and I'm saying that how can you guarantee what, you know, you don't know what's going to happen to electricity. Right. But I know for sure it's not going to stay the same for 20 years. Right. Right. But they're all able to uh, win a bid to stay with that uh, assumption. So it looks like a, it's about a $2 million saving over 20 years, all these together, if there is no increase in electricity cost. If it goes up 2% a year, it could be as much as $4 million savings. But we took the most conservative estimate. Thank you. Mr. Cobb? Okay. Good. 
Any comments from the public? Back to the board. Are we ready to vote? Just one more. Oh, yeah. Again, confirming that these, as you said last time, the town attorney yep. has had a chance to review, and in part because there were a lot of documents for this meeting, yes. and I can't say that I was I was <laughs> able to go through them as thoroughly. So I just want to know. I confirmed. I, yeah, did, I confirmed it with him on Monday again. That fine yep. tooth comb. Yep. Okay. Are we ready to vote? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That brings up item number 12. To here consider and act upon the following resolution as requested by the Director of Public Works. Resolved that the granting of an easement to Green Skies for the purpose of erecting a photovoltaic electric generation system on the roof of the Senior Center at 100 Mona Terrace for the sole benefit of the Senior Center, the term of this agreement being 20 years B and hereby is approved. May I have a motion to accept? So moved. A second. Second. All right. Uh, Mr. Bowman, do you want to step us through any of that? Well, it's before we exactly what I just said. It's just on a different building, in fact. Uh, yeah, I'd rather answer questions or if you want me to go through it. And I, yours? I forgot to ask this last time. So I think I mentioned before, I have solar panels on my house now, and we had to put a new roof on. I meant to ask that about the garage as well. Um, what's the status of, of the roofs? Are they? Yeah. The engineering department look at these rules before we propose anything on them. So, example, at the police station, before we put the, the generator up there, the engineering department went through it, and that needed some improvements to be made, and the improvements were made. On the Paul Wars garage, uh, no improvements are required. Uh, they've already looked at that. Okay. And this is at the senior center? Same, the same thing. Same thing. They, these, so because, as you know, they're not that heavy. The generator was very, you know, it was like 3,000 pounds concentrated in a small area, which is why they had to make improvements. When this is spread out over a small area, the pounds per square foot is a lot less, and the impact of snow on it is a lot less. Therefore, these roofs are, will handle it. Um, if, I'm sorry, I'm if, what is the kind of, the plan if there was some kind of issue for some reason with the roof? Well, if, if there is a... Do we then have to pay for the removal of the units? And no. I mean, again, if, if we're at fault on the roof, it would be our responsibility. If they're at fault, it's their responsibility. If it's force majeure, lightning strikes that are a tree falls on it, then it becomes our responsibility also. But if anything they do to the roof actually damages the roof, it's their responsibility to fix it. Okay, thank you. Just to expand on uh, Kristen's question, um, Senior center roof has is kind of was half redone, mm -hmm. half existing. Yeah. Can you just elaborate on where this is going? And, and it's going to go on the, the safe portion of the roof, <laughs> <laughs> with what it was redone. That's right. And and if it didn't work there, we would put it on the field, uh, on the ground. You know, if it doesn't fit exactly in there, the, the, there's there's still some question. You can still put it out on the ground, just like we at the railroad station, just put it on covered. Now, as, as I remember, that's not a flat roof. That's a V shape. Mm -hmm. And the directional of the roof has been considered, so we're okay from a sunlight standpoint. Yep. If it were. They wouldn't; uh, these guys wouldn't be proposing it. They didn't think they could make money on it. And uh, any of the roofs that were—that's why I didn't want a roof for the recreation center. Uh, there was the rail, the railroad katons shield the, the sun and her enough so it wouldn't be feasible on there. It went on the park lines. The, some trees would be trimmed to make sure of that. But that's about it. Kylie, any just, that's an important question. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Just a quick one as far as the installation and all the work that gets physically done for that. Do, does the vendor do all of that work? Yes. Do we contribute any work, any hours, any labor, no, any time? No. We may pave the parking lot. To, you know, like the recreation, we decided we're going to pave the parking lot. Mm -hmm. So everything looks nice and new there. But that's just the, for the benefit of the recreation center, not of the project. Okay. Thank you. At this point. Any comments from the public? Seeing none, back to the board. Are we ready to vote? Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Item number 13. To here consider and act upon a request from the Director of Public Works resolve <coughs> that the granting of an easement to Skyview Solar for the purpose of erecting a photovoltaic electric generation system on the roof of the Fairfield Theater Company at 70 Sanford Street for the sole benefit of the Fairfield Theater Company. The term of this agreement being 20 years B and hereby is approved. So moved. 
A second? Second. I think I might correct it. It's really for the sole benefit of the town because we're paying the electric bill. That was my first question. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. So we're going to need amend that, I think. We're going to need to, for the sole benefit of the town of, Fairfield. town of Fairfield. Just to get that out of the way, may I have a motion to amend this resolution uh, replacing Fairfield Theater Company with the town of Fairfield? So moved. A second. Second. Any discussion? Any comments from the public? Back to the board. Are we ready to vote on the amendment? Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion before us has amended. Back to you, Mr. Bowman. Okay. Any, uh, Once again, <coughs> the roof was had, put on the part of the roof that was rebuilt over the last few years, so it's mm -hmm. you know, we know it can handle it. That's the number one question we have. And uh, so that's why it's sized. If we could use the whole roof, it would have been better. We're using the part of the roof that's safe to put it on. So. And the rest of it's the same. So. Again, the question of have uh, the folks at Fairfield Theater Company and any of the other folks immediately impacted physically, have they been um, notified and are they part of the conversation? No, they have not. I mean, basically, uh, it's none of their business, so to speak. But we will, once it's approved, we want to talk to them about it. They're, they're not impacting on their operation whatsoever. It's the interior of the building, we're going on the roof of the building, we're responsible for the utilities and the HVAC equipment on the building that we're just doing that. But we tell them if we're doing it, yes, of course. But we didn't need their approval. Right, no. Just, again, the communication. I, yeah. This one is a little bit different in that um, I know, again, using the residential example, that sometimes folks are concerned about appearances, that not everyone loves the look of that. And um, I'm just, I don't have a photo for that one. So I'm wondering what, kind of visibility will be and I'm very much in support of this project I tend to be a function over fashion kind of person <laughs> but um, in this case just wondering well I think there'll be some visibility from up Wall Road if you're walking by down the hill but you're not going to see it from Sanford Street or the railroad station you know that roof is high enough and mm. the, it will be close enough to the roof it'll be very uh, almost invisible but you look down on it from Sanford or Uncle Road if you're walking Any further questions from the board? Mr. Yeah, Pat? just quickly, when I go through these items that we're voting on, I see that, you know, Skyview Skull Solar is item 13 and 14, and Green Skies is 11 and 12, and NCON would be item 10 when we get to it. Can you, do they have different specialties? Um, is there anything you can share about these organizations, no. why some were chosen for one and some were chosen for the other? Other than NCON, I can't, we, we did a, like a, a lot of it wasn't an RFP, but a lot of people made proposals to us so about a year ago before we did the first proposals, and we took all of those companies and looked at their background stats, etc., and compared them. And they, they all made proposals also for, for the same buildings, so we could take a look at you know what price they were bidding, uh, whether mm -hmm. it was realistic or not, what price they were offering us, what was realistic or not, right. and, and then eliminated some of them. Uh, some of the companies only did smaller projects, so okay. we separated those. Some did larger, or two of them did larger. Uh, one of the companies that did larger actually backed out of working with us, and Green Skies is the one we chose from there. Skyview was one we chose from the smaller one because they had by far the best proposals that done work in Fairfield County. None mm -hmm. of them been around for 20 years. I mean, this well, business that's hasn't been around 20 years for right. the most part. Right. But they had all of them, they had success rates in Connecticut. That's the, the biggest thing. Now, NCON came along, they, they came out of nowhere, basically, and made the proposal on the railroad station to the parking authority. Mm -hmm. And we walked, worked it through with them, make sure they're making <coughs> the same uh, the same basis they're doing here. You're, you're, you're offering some lower price versus the current rate of electricity for 20 years. Not, mm -hmm. but otherwise, you could you assume electricity is going up 2% a year, you could offer a hell of a rate. You know? But if it doesn't go up, we're stuck with paying more. So we made sure all those, the, the was bid on this exact same premises now and NCON had, has put these type of facilities before in Long Island on the railroad station so for that reason we decided to go with them. Right. So they, they they made sense for the larger one and on the smaller and medium sized projects you're comfortable that we've got the right vendor on each yeah. building. Uh, and I'm sure there's three or four more out there that are similarly uh, capable but for people that made proposals to us and we interviewed yes. Mm -hmm. There's, there's mm -hmm. a dozen vendors out there doing this now that all of which are good. Yeah. And the other interesting point you made is, you know, this hasn't been going on for 20 years. Yeah. So, what, so when you look at doing a 20-year contract with a company that 
has been doing it for three or four or five years. There's inherent risk there. Yeah. But there's, there's, you know, termination clauses and there's performance clauses mm -hmm. in the contracts that have been reviewed and approved. Yeah. So it sounds like we're going to be okay in, in the big picture. What we're trying to do is minimize the risk. Because again, right. that's one of the reasons we didn't want to just buy it. I'm a public works employee, we don't feel we are capable of maintaining and running these types of systems. Mm -hmm. you know, have the company that build them be responsible for the maintenance and the fixing and repairing them rather than t the town. So that's another reason we did it this way. Okay. One last question. Who was the final decision maker on choosing the vendors? <coughs> Basically, we did it the first selectman, myself, the, public, uh, the director of finance and the public works director sat down and reviewed all these. Went through all the proposals? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Uh, hey, Mr. Bowen, if I could, could you describe kind of the process that's been gone through here? They came to us, they filled out an application, um, yep. stepped through each of the steps okay. before they came back and got approved and, and yep. how this they all they came to us with and said, well, we're interested in doing projects with the town. Mm -hmm. now, some of them chose buildings, some of them didn't. We gave them bills to choose, and they came back to us with proposals. And as we had the each proposal, and we reviewed it, you know, I said the economics, the, the experience of the, the of the company, they were experienced in Connecticut, whether they did large or small. Right. And some of them wouldn't wouldn't even bid on the large ones. That's not their focus. Yeah, right. Some wouldn't bid on the small. It's not their focus. And, we, and separated those into those particular types: the large versus the medium, the small. And then uh, interviewed them and uh, chose the proposals from there. Okay. Thank you. You may recall that I had amended the minutes of an earlier yes. meeting. Yes, I was June, wondering what it was. <laughs> related to the conversation about the schools. I had asked you at that meeting, oh, okay. um, when we look at all these projects, it's incredibly exciting. We're doing this all over town, really. I mean, you're taking yeah. advantage of it as much as you can based on companies coming in, as the first left me just said and you've repeated and emphasized. And I'm wondering about the possibilities for our school buildings. I know that's not your purview, um, but since we saw you back in early June, have you had any other conversation with Tom Cullen from the school uh, district? They, except for the Tomlinson in this project, and I know uh, they're looking at it at Riverfield. You know, again, they're they're very conscious of roofs too and what's going to happen. Uh, much more than we are. They're just more conservative than we are, but. As uh, some, I know, a member of the building committee is also an energy task force. Is, is really bulldogging that, trying to get them on uh, Riverfield to consider solar on the roof there as they go forward. Uh, I haven't talked to them recently about a success, but we should see what happens. And I do know that they are they were working with us with UI now, Board Ed, which they weren't in the past. So they're moving in that direction, but they're, but they're slower than we are. But this is probably going to be around for the next 10 years. The schools are obviously targeted at huge flat roofs. I mean, this mm -hmm. is a perfect thing, perfect place to do it, really. They could do a lot. I mean, when you look at Ludlow Ward and Ludlow Middle School, I mean, they're ideal targets for this. So I think we should... Well, it occurs to me when you're talking about what you just said about the fact that we're leasing, we didn't buy, and in terms of liability, it ends up on those companies. We're locking in at certain yeah. rates, and I'm hopeful that we can really strongly um, engage in those conversations on the town side with the Board of Education um, and I recognize the, the considerations are different because we have different needs in different buildings. Uh, well, I think that conversation is. has to start at a higher level than me is what I'm saying. <laughs> I'll well, be glad to help on that. I'll just encourage the first selectman then to continue that conversation <laughs> with Dr. Title. I really, I think it's critical. I, it's yeah. in, to take advantage of this, this is an opportunity. You've done a phenomenal job. But you see, I know, one of the reasons I know they're interested, a year ago we had some fuel cell proposals also, which didn't win, and three of them were at the schools. They were one, they, were, they, they submitted bids for Ludlow Ward and Ludlow Middle School for fuel cells a year ago, but again, they didn't win those bids. But, so I know they are interested. That was a big step. Fuel cells is a lot harder to deal with than right. both of the talent, so. And again, mm -hmm. the, just a, a little more background, just so we're all clear, that the economics on, in this whole kind of sub-industry have changed. Yes. Uh, a lot of Absolutely. it is being, in essence, promoted and uh, subsidized by the yes. state yes. Uh, with UI's help. So what's happening is, uh, and let's take the fuel cells, uh, one, Ludlow and Ward were both involved in those because they didn't go on the roofs, and as we know, Ludlow and Ward are both in, have projects underway to 
uh, renovate their roofs. So uh, a roof system may not be appropriate in the short term, the longer term it certainly would be. Uh, but specifically, the, uh, in essence, these companies would come to the town, uh, apply with us to, so that we would uh, allow them uh, okay. to place an application with the state. Based on their economics with the state, some of them won or not. As Ed mentioned, a couple uh, companies that we had uh, agreed to allow to, to bid on our behalf didn't win uh, in the state lottery, for lack of a better term. Yeah, the reverse um, auctions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they have an opportunity the next year when that's opened up again to go back. So this is something that had just started off, something I think Connecticut is pretty innovative with in terms yes. of mm -hmm. what our state is doing to promote green energy. Uh, to give a chance for, again, this is something that town is getting involved in um, at no cost and with all savings, all the upside, that the town involvement here is we get to save our costs on electric electricity based on the use of uh, alternative energy sources like this. So uh, it's, it's, it's a huge change in how energy is delivered. It's a huge change in the economics. It's a payback to our uh, residents and taxpayers. Uh, through this. Uh, again, uh, it's another example of Mr. Bowman going uh, to the ends of the earth to make sure that we find every penny we can save on energy costs, and, and I think he deserves our thanks and compliments uh, in doing that again. But this is a different approach. It's not a program that was around four years ago or five years ago. Without the state getting involved, without the state setting this up, without the state providing the subsidy and structure, we would not be here uh, discussing this. You know, the other thing, too, is using the most conservative economics approach. That's why we didn't win the fuel cells. If we allowed them to as assume a 1% a year escalation in cost, they would have bid lower to the state and probably got it. But then we would have been stuck if the energy price didn't go up that fast. So, right. so we don't want to do that either. So. Right. But they'll keep trying. <laughs> right. I just, just to follow up in terms of the school piece, I'm glad that you noted that because I, I recognize that it is a change. And again, I've used my, my own residential situation certainly the solarized connecticut program was a big incentive for a lot of folks and the economic model is a big part of that and i think that's true for the town so i do recognize you know that that is a change for for all of us and um want to mm -hmm. recognize that as well when we were having conversations as a town a number of years back in terms of school buildings and and if it made sense you know, things have shifted quite a bit so mm. I appreciate you. Again, following up with Mike said, so the power purchase agreement concept has been around for a long time, but it didn't work without the state subsidy because you know it's just too expensive. Yeah. Well, yeah. it didn't work without the state subsidy. They've made a number of changes to it to make the program work. And again, another area that, that Mr. Bowman probably doesn't get enough credit for is working with the commissioner of DEEP to make uh, changes to how these programs work, frankly, to make them work so that, that they work for everybody going out. So again, we're approving some of the things before us. We're looking at these projects because the state listened to Mr. Bowman and made some changes so that these would be more effective uh, going forward. Okay. Quick question. When I was on vacation up in New Hampshire, um, I was doing some reading um, in some Vermont newspapers. And Vermont appears to be, from what I can tell, on the cutting edge of alternative technology and energy sources. At least that's my understanding. And they have some programs up there that I think are more geared toward residential homes, but I think even some smaller towns are using them where they produce their own electricity and the excess, not that we're in an excess position today, but I don't know what that would take to get there, but the excess energy that they're allowed to produce, they're, they, they're selling it back to the grid do that, right. for, for resale to other people. So I don't know if there's any... And, and there's there's inherent issues with that as well. They have people's, they don't have enough people paying bills to fund other parts of the company. But putting that aside, are are there any opportunities either within the state for either residents or for municipalities to actually overcreate energy yeah. and derive some economic benefit from it? Yes, to both. Yes, to both. There's an existing program which allows you to sell back your excess power to the power company for the same price they charge you for it but only up to the amount you buy from the company. Is that okay? So if you, you produce 80% of the power you need and buy 20% from UI, say, if you produce a 20% excess, they'll buy it back at the same price you pay for it. Mm -hmm. You get beyond that, it gets into that wholesale market at three or four cents and it would cost you money to do it. Okay. That's for the town. But for the town, 
they've created a virtual net metering program. That's called net metering. Virtual net metering means if we were able to, we could actually design a facility uh, to build power down at the landfill, let's say, not a big solar, which we're looking at the next time around, and, sit and tell you why we want that power to be credited to the library. And that's virtual net metering. It's never connected to the library, it's connected to the system. But at that amount of power we so make there could be credited to the library up to five buildings. Okay. And you don't get the full credit for it, but you get 90% of what uh, UI would sell it to you for. You got to leave them somewhere. I mean, they are doing distribution, so there's right. a piece of it there. So the answer is yes to both. And Interesting. We're looking at that. <laughs> Interesting. That's next time. That just changed. It That's did. one of the things we they changed in the law in, in June, the last day. Some of our suggestions, and now that we're going to go forward. But the yeah. other thing that changed was it was only eligible last year if the town owned the facility. And we said, it doesn't make any sense. You created a program for the private guys on and take the risk, and the program doesn't work then. So they changed it. Now you can do it through the private sector. Now, so. Interesting. I think when you look at the economics, this, our state is it's something we should be proud of. The state is really taking a lead in coming up with ways to finance this, to help improve this industry, to help improve the environment and our economy. Um, we didn't mention at the time, but I do want to point out uh, that as part of the CPACE program, that is really structured based on financing that allows that to make mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, uh, Tom Flynn, Chair of the Board of Finance, uh, is involved with the uh, CEFIA group yeah. um, at the state level. That, so he's been involved in kind of structuring this and making it available to the state. So uh, our state's really been doing some tremendous um, innovations. Um, in short years, it's amazing. Uh, and it's and been an it me. They're willing to make the changes to make it work. In the past, if something was in it, it was fixed. It didn't work. It would take years to get a change. Every year, they're changing and making it better. So it was, it was uh, to that point, I mean, it was interesting to see the expression on Ed's face when he wrote up some things, and we sent them along to Commissioner Esty, and the commissioner responded, yeah. sat down with Ed, said, tell me how this all works. He did and made the changes. So all of a sudden, two months later, they're coming back with a program that works. The first version frankly, it wouldn't have worked. Yeah. Uh, but we didn't know the changes we made, but then all of a sudden, the end of the lecture, there they were. <laughs> it's great. So it, it, uh, it's been quite an education, uh, sitting with Mr. Bowman as we've gone through this, uh, and look at all the different ways things are happening. And again, this is good for the economy. It's good for the environment. Um, it's, it's just a great example. And I think it's one of the ways that Connecticut, even though we're a small state, it, it, we're kind of leading the nation, I think, in some of these yeah. financial innovations to get this done. With that said, are we ready to vote? Yes. Uh, item number <laughs> Thanks, 13 sir. is before us <laughs> as amended. Yes. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Next up, item 14. I think Mr. Bowman, you're here Aye. again. <laughs> Let me uh, get this motioned and seconded, and then we can carry on. To hear, consider, and act upon the following resolution as requested by the Director of Public Works. Resolved that the granting of an easement to Skyview Solar for the purpose of erecting a photovoltaic electric generation system on the roof of Fire Headquarters at 140 Reef Road for the sole benefit of Fire Headquarters. The term of this agreement being 20 years B and his, hereby is approved. May I have a motion to accept? So moved. As second. <laughs> second. All right. Mr. Bowman, clarify any differences? Yes, I will. It doesn't, doesn't show in the document you have, but this contractor, Skyview, did not win this project. This was one of the smaller ones we did last month, but they did it out of a lot of where we got the rec center and what was the other one? I forgot already. Uh, hmm. Oh, it was Operation Hope. Yeah. Right. But he didn't get picked for this uh, for Fairfield Fire Headquarters. He said, if I get the other two, the theater and uh, I'm losing track of what he did, but the Fairfield Theater Company. Then he, uh, well, he just got the theater company. I'm sorry, because he already had the the rec center. He would do this one without without even getting the financing grant. He'd do it with his own money at the, under the same terms and conditions as the other ones. So he isn't getting that subsidy on this program, but he's putting it in anyway for our benefit. He can apply for it in the future, but he's still taking the risk that he's going to get you know the financing for it. So it's a, that's pretty good. I thought. Very good. Any questions? Kristen? Any questions from the public? Seeing none, back to the board. Are we ready to vote? Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 
Congratulations, Mr. Bowman. Is that all there is? The Bowman Show is over. <laughs> well, until next month. Yeah, and again, thank you very much. <laughs> it's Lawyer Goro. If we've done this again, they announced a new microgrid program today, so we'll be there. Dynamite. Oh, Dynamite. Great. Good stuff. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. And all right. He's wearing green, too. Yeah, yeah right? Is this a, is that a, it's not football season yet. You're not pointing out Notre Dame colors yet, are you? No, green, green no. energy. Sorry. I have a football mentality. Um, or Eagles colors. Watch it. <laughs> Item 15, tax collector. <laughs> also more green. To consider and act upon tax refunds as recommended by the tax collector. May I have a motion to accept? So moved. A second. Second. Uh, Discussion? May I? Uh, yes. Um, by the way, this is the universal green here, right? The the motion is to act upon refunds, and I would like to just specify the amount as requested by our tax collector, and the amount of thirty-seven thousand nine hundred fifty-three dollars and ninety-three cents. I believe our motion is required to have the, the amount motion, in there. Does it? Yes. Okay, Jen, if we could have the standard phrase on here, leave a blank so we can make sure that we always remember to include the dollar amount in there. Okay. Great. That would be good. Um, so this is going to be, we're going to, that's a motion to amend this. Yes. Kristen, to say to consider and act upon tax refunds in the, the amount, amount of, of $37,953.93. As recommended by the tax collector. Correct. Is there a second? Second. All right. Any discussion on the motion to amend? No. Any comments from the public? Back to the board. Ready to vote on the amendment? Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, the resolution is before us as amended. Any further discussion? No. No? No. Okay. Any comments from the public? No? All right. Uh, are we ready to vote? Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Hear and consider upon any communications. Uh, we have none at this time. To hear, consider, and act upon any other business. We have none at this time. May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all. Thank you.